Hey everyone, uh, I'm Joey, the CEO of SG Innovate. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with SG Innovate, uh, we are a government-backed company whose role is to develop the um, deep tech economy by building an ecosystem around it and by investing in deep tech startups. Uh, it is my great honor and pleasure, as always, to be hosting today's event together with Her Excellency Sandra Jensen Landi, uh, Ambassador of Denmark to Singapore. I'm excited for us to dive into today's topic. Much like our Danish friends, we take our appreciation of food very seriously. So much so that our street food culture, otherwise known as hawker food, was recently inscribed into UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage of humanity list. Uh, part of ensuring that this celebration of culinary heritage continues to thrive and remain accessible to all of course, is the ability to produce food uh, in a sustainable yet affordable manner. We have been very extremely, we have been extremely fortunate to not have experienced acute food insecurity during this uh, pandemic. But in order to hit our target of 30 by 30, which by the way, is a goal set out by the government of Singapore for us to uh, be producing 30% of our nutritional needs locally and sustainably by 2030, uh, right now, it's about 10%. Then our existing food production processes need heavy retooling to overcome land and resource constraints, which are you know, a given in, in Singapore. Um, so this is an area I believe we have much to learn from our Danish friends. Uh, Denmark, of course, has made tremendous advances on many fronts, um, uh, incorporating emerging technologies for precision agriculture to climate-friendly production methods as part of their larger mission to make Danish food production carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, in the past year, Denmark welcomed Europe's largest vertical farm capable of producing 1,000 tons of greens annually, which is an amazing uh, project uh, by Nordic Harvest, whose founder analyst is with us today on this panel. This is an area of practice we are looking at quite closely in Singapore as well. Vertical farms by companies such as Comcrop, Birdy Veggies, and Sustenier are taking over industrial facilities and rooftops across the, across the island. And looking beyond vegetables, some innovative companies have moved into vertical fish farming, the most notable being Apollo Aquaculture's highly automated eight-story facility. There are countless other areas of agricultural innovation for us to explore, and I will leave today's discussion in the good hands of our expert panel. In the meantime, as always, I urge you to pose your questions and be part of the conversation. Uh, but before I hand things over to Ambassador Landy, I'd like to thank our partners, the Danish Embassy in Singapore, for their continued support and close partnership. Today's event would not have been possible without their help. And I look forward to deepening our collaboration as we dive further into the potential of deep tech to address humanity's biggest challenges. And on that note, over to you, Sandra. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lim, and thank you to Jody and the rest of the team at SG Innovate. It is, as always, a great pleasure to work with you. It's both innovation in action and a very, very high level of professionalism, so thank you. It is, as you say, a really exciting topic we are here uh, to discuss today, the future of farming. And it is a topic where lots of innovations are happening in both uh, Singapore and in Denmark. Uh, we, we access this topic from different um, different points of view. As you say, in, in Singapore, it's the 30 by 30, the 30% 30 in 2030 a goal that that is um, that all eyes are on. Uh, from a Danish perspective, it's probably more focused on the sustainability angle. How can we ensure a more sustainable food production that can help us bring us to our yeah, the climate neutral goal in 2050, but also a 70% already by 2030. So these are, these are really uh, the goals we have in mind. And I think it goes for both the Singaporean goal and the Danish goal that we honestly don't know where to how to get there yet. So we are so happy that today we have uh, some of the people, uh, this, the real front runners in this area uh, gathered from, from our two countries and they will tell us where they are. It is an industry in development. I have visited some of the farms here in Singapore and I tell you, it's so fascinating to see what's going on. Um, 
they are all, everyone we have with us today are breaking new grounds. They are showing new ways of doing food production. And I have to say, I will, I will sit back and, and listen and learn and see, uh, dream about which future we are looking into. We have uh, Kirsten Holm with us from Food Nation uh, Denmark, which is a private, private public partnership. And she will steer us through the discussion. Uh, as uh, Dr. Lim said, please pose all your questions. Um, I might post some myself, as I really have a lot to learn in, in this area. Uh, but I will not take up any more of your time because I am not an expert in this area. So I will give the, the floor to, to uh, Kristen Holm and please over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ambassador Sandra uh, Landi. And thank you so much, Dr. Lim, um, for inviting me here today to participate in such an interesting webinar focusing on sustainable farming. Um, it's really a pleasure being here. And I know it's a lot of people joining the event, both from uh, Singapore, but also other parts of the world. And um, it's important to talk about this topic from an international perspective as well. But today we'll take a deep dive from a Danish and Singaporean perspective. Um, my name is Christine Holman and I'm a senior product manager at Food Nation and I'm the moderator of today's seminar. And um, first of all, I would like to say a few words about Food Nation. So I will share a short presentation and then we will go over to the panel debate. Mm -hmm. I can see. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we have to move back camp. I can see it's um, perhaps Jody can help out here because. Uh, Yep, sure. I can share my screen. Just give me a moment. Um, I don't know why it's showing in the other window because this is not the first slide. It's all right. I'll show the PDF. Oh, um, I go back now. So I shortly go back. Yes. So now we're on. And um, okay, Yodi, I think I can share the. Sorry, would you like to try again? I think it works fine. Okay. Uh, yes. So. So Food Nation is a go-to portal for international private and public decision makers seeking information about the Danish agriculture and food sector. And uh, we are a public-private partnership, as the ambassador also mentioned previously, and we are a non-for-profit organization. And that's exactly what gives us both credibility and agility to speak about uh, on behalf of the Danish agriculture and food sector. But we also have His Royal Highness uh, Crown Prince Frederick as our patron of Food Nation. And as a patron, His Royal Highness helps increase the knowledge of Danish food products and solutions to markets around the world. And Denmark uh, is quite a small country. As you can see, it's up in the northern part of Europe, very small dot but we actually have a very long record as a food nation. We do export a lot, about 25% of our total export is within the agriculture and food sector. So even though we are a small nation, we do have um, an international outreach. But I would like to share a small video with you about the Danish food sector. So here it comes. The global food supply is facing vast challenges, uneven distribution of food, climate change, food loss and waste, malnutrition and obesity. With a growing population, we must collaborate to ensure a reliable supply of sustainable, safe, high quality food.
to consumers all over the world, both now and in the future. Somewhere in the world, there's the perfect food business partner for you. A partner who can help grow your business in the global food arena. A business area characterized by enormous growth. It's highly likely that your future food business partner will come from Denmark. Even though our own agricultural area is relatively modest, Danish food production feeds three times our own population. Denmark is one of the market leaders in both primary and processed food production, food equipment and ingredients industry, know-how and research. Doing business with the Danish food cluster, you become a part of tomorrow's opportunities and solutions. In Denmark, successful researchers, entrepreneurs and food producers are already future bound when it comes to their knowledge of resource efficiency, sustainability and innovation. Let's collaborate across nations to convert the global challenges into opportunities. Food Nation is a public-private partnership established by the Danish government and leading private organizations and companies working as a gateway for international stakeholders seeking information about Danish food solutions. Join the Danish food cluster as a business partner or build a career in a field where you will contribute to creating change and discovering better solutions of tomorrow. So this was a glimpse of the Danish solutions out there, but now we will take a closer look on innovative technology as an enabler to secure sustainable agriculture and food within sustainable farming. Um, Danish innovative technology is making the best of limited resources and tackling the challenges we face in the global food supply. And those massive challenges in, are, for example, the fact that we need to minimize the carbon emissions, feeding a growing global population, reduce energy and water consumption and transform to more sustainable energy alternatives. And at the moment, 38% of the ice-free land is already used for agriculture. But innovative technology um, is the key to cope with those challenges and can support a green transition and global warming by producing more with less, minimize environmental footprint and secure food safety and quality. It becomes clear that innovative technology can address some of the challenges put into the framework of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, as we now will zoom in on a few of those a little bit more. So 35% increase in world population by 2050 is one of the challenges. The other one is 19% increase in, the, in global agriculture water consumption by 2015 and 25% of world food calories are lost due to food loss and waste across the value chain. And 21% of food productivity is already lost due to global warming. But partnerships is the key to meet the four challenges. And it's only possible to meet those challenges if we collaborate across nations. From a Danish perspective, innovative uh, Denmark's ability to, to contribute solving the challenges is rooted in being the world first cooperative movement that made us an innovative technology leader. And today collaboration between Danish universities, business industry associations and the government is a core pillar of successful innovation and technology development. And as you can see on the screen, this is the triple helix model in the, in the middle and the Danish collaborative model is one of the key for successful innovation and also speeding up the innovation a bit today in the Danish society. Taking a closer look on how innovative technology supports parts of the value chain, we need visionary tools. Visionary tools that both respect resources that supports both the primary sector, as you can see on the left hand, but also the food processing part, as you can see on the right hand. Zooming in a little bit on the primary sector, 
We can see many new different kinds of solutions. These are three um, chosen solutions that also, of course, there are many more, but we do see an increase in precision farming, artificial intelligence and bound technologies. But we also need more visionary tools. We need something that is looking into the future and also the current challenges and future challenges. And then it's important with continuous innovation, the future urban farming and 3D printing. And today we will zoom in on the future of urban farming and vertical farming as one of the elements within future farming. There are lots of different technologies that can be addressed, but by zooming in into one area as we, that's are relevant for both countries from different perspectives. Uh, we hope that we can uh, inspire you to look into even more possible areas of solutions. But of course, as mentioned before, it's only possible to collaborate, to meet those challenges. Also the 2050 goal of being carbon neutral in Denmark and the 3030 plan in Singapore. Um, and collaboration is the key. And today we do have four interesting panelists joining our panel debate. And um, I would love to welcome all four of you. Mr. Anes Riemann, founder of Nordic Harvest, and um, Mr. Anke Schara, founder and CEO of Vertiveggies, Mr. Rasmus Bianco, CEO and founder, co-founder of Next Food, and Dr. Ritu Bala, Senior Manager, Agriculture Research and Innovation Center, Republic Polytechnics. You're more than welcome, and I will stop sharing here. So welcome all of you to the panel debate. This was a short introduction about innovative technology and the challenges we meet. Now we will talk a little bit more about um, possibilities and challenges we are addressing in different countries and uh, how we can come over those. So you're more than welcome to put on your uh, camera and all four panelists so we can see you. And perhaps uh, Mr. Anke Shah would like to have uh, would like to start out a short introduction of yourself. Uh, and Thank you, Kristen. Good morning. Oh. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Ankesh. Uh, I'm based in Singapore. So I've been working in the agri-food sector since the last 15 years now. I'm very passionate about increasing food production, not just in Singapore, but across Asia. And I and I want to uh, and my greater vision is to be able to connect food with agriculture in the minds of the consumer. So I'm involved in the sector in three capacities. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Bertie Veggies, which is a six year old um, precision farming company based here in Singapore. I'm also the founder and executive director of a seed breeding and genetics company that's developing high yielding seeds for small farmers in Asia. And uh, I also have a farm inputs project that is working alongside the seed company to optimize the basket of inputs for small farmers. And finally, I also invest in agri-food tech companies where we can see long-term synergy. And thank you to SG Innovate for having me here. Thank you so much. Um, Anders Riemann, you're more than welcome to take over the next presentation. Hello, my name is uh, Anders Riemann, uh, founder of uh, Nordic Harvest, uh, which is a what I would call a classic industrial sized uh, vertical farm built here in Copenhagen um, to uh, add uh, a Northern Europe's biggest distribution center for fruits and vegetables. So we uh, will contribute with 1000 tons of uh, lettuce, herbs, and kale to the Danish uh, market and uh, thereby avoid uh, importing uh, these uh, products in the winter time. And our vision is to uh, prove that it's possible to move some of the agriculture into the cities where it can be produced on a much smaller space and in high consistent quality year round. And uh, so the end uh, goal is to uh, reforest agricultural land and um, um, which will help uh, fight the climate change and in the long run uh, have a much better balance between uh, humankind uh, or people uh, uh, moving into the cities and then leave uh, the areas outside 
of the cities uh, to the nature uh, undisturbed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anders. And um, welcome, uh, Dr. Ritu Bala. You are more than welcome to make a short presentation. Thanks, Christine. So hi, I am Ritu, and a good afternoon as well as a good morning to everybody. So uh, for me, I am uh, leading the Research and Innovation Center at uh, Republic Polytechnic. So the Polytechnic here works very closely with the industry in order to form the bond between the academia and industry. And at the center will be our students whom we are training them to be the workforce for the industry, right? And uh, for me, uh, personally, I am more interested in the research work where I am uh, trained in um, genomics as well as metabolomics that helps in terms of understanding how the plant uh, grows and uh, how we could determine or increase the quality of the plant that we are growing here, especially when we're doing it indoors so we are focusing on a lot uh, of um, collaborations over here, and I'm very happy to be a part of this discussion today, and such that we can offer training and research to our students as well as uh, who will be, you know, the next generation growers here. Yeah, so that's for me, and thanks for to SG Innovate to have me here to be able to share my thoughts. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, welcome uh, Mr. Rasmus Bianco. See if he's uh, with us. We'll just try to unmute there. Thank you, Kristen. Okay. I'm Rasmus Bianco and co-founder and, and, uh, and CEO in NextFood. We uh, develop uh, the entire technology stack for vertical farms and operate vertical farms. Our goal is to um, continuously improve that. Um, it's a uh, it's a sector and it's a very new industry uh, that has more than a promise to, to uh, really revolutionize a big part of agriculture, bring it into uh, the digital age from a, a, a very industrialized age. So we see vertical farming as a supplement to, uh, to many of the other uh, good initiatives happening around the world and to the existing agriculture that also has to change uh, we don't believe that it's the only way uh, of doing this, uh, but we do believe that it is going to have a very big role in the future. And it's one of those technologies in a world where climate, and it's about time, is getting up on the agenda. It's one of those technologies that is really making an impact today and has a very clear path ahead, uh, where many other technologies are, are, are still in, in, in the research phase. So, so we believe that, that we'll see much more uh, vertical farming, uh, both in, in, in the, the East and West, and, and really uh, think that this is going to be the norm in, in, quite, uh, in quite a short uh, span of years. Thank you very much, Rasmus, and thank you all of you for a short presentation. I think we continue on that topic as uh, Rasmus already went into here. What are the possibilities um, for the future? So vertical farming is one of the technological solutions that supports a sustainable future in farming. Uh, and, but why is it interesting? If you can take a little bit of a deep dive into that topic, um, Rasmus, and then I can go over to Anke Shah, who can share his perspective as well. So then we have one from the Danish side and one from the Singaporean perspective. Well, I mean, end of the day, it's, it's, um, it's about the food supply chain and vertical farming is merely a tool. So we have to look from farm to fork, um, or as we say in Danish, from soil to plate or something. Uh, well, in this case, we don't have any soil, which is one of the advantages. So, so we really have here a, a production platform that uh, looks at the physical conditions of the plant and create an environment where the plant, given its DNA, can, can can be produced in such a way that it becomes optimal for food with the least uh, use of resources, the least um, amount of externalities, meaning pollution. So when we save 98% water, we save uh, more than 75% nutrients, we can have the CO2 foot footprint. Uh, we have a factor of, of uh, 200 to 400 in, in, in um, space usage, meaning that when we have like a square meter inside, uh, a, a warehouse we can we can build 
forest uh, on, on 200 square meters or 400 square meters far, uh, farmland and, and have nature there instead, that has a huge impact. So there's a number of, it really takes all the boxes. We are electrifying agriculture and so on. And that, that, that means that we, uh, we are radically changing the conditions of creating a new platform for uh, producing uh, f- our food, or at least uh, an important part of, of the food we, we, produ- uh, we need. So that's, that's the interesting part. And that is more than a dream. It's really reality today. And of course, Rome was not built in a day. So, so uh, this is going to develop over the years to come. Thank you very much. And uh, what is your perspective um, on vertical farming and design and what it can contribute with for the future? Uh, thank you, Kristen. So maybe if I just take a step back and look at Singapore's perspective. And so the strategy always has been of has been threefold. And that's why the food price in Singapore have been stable over many years is because Singapore has a three-pronged approach. One is food diversification, uh, where we are uh, importing from many, many different sources. And the second one being grow overseas and third one being grow local. So I think it's the trifecta of these three policies that has allowed uh, Singapore to hang, arrive very, uh, to um, rank very highly in the food security index. Uh, time and time again. But uh, I think last year, a lot of these strategies got tested. Um, When borders shut down, there was a clear logistics issue, government started looking inward, and there was a supply chain problem. To me, I think that was a big wake up call, I think, uh, and a a greater impetus to actually focus on the grow local basket. Even though the 30 by 30 strategy has been in place for many years, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, a lot of um, regulatory agencies have taken a fresh look at the sector to see what's possible in terms of um, growing locally here in Singapore. Now, of course, like Singapore has got is limited by land. There are, there are resources that, you know, there's some things that you cannot change. And that means you have to look at technology to be able to make an impact. Uh, my experience in vertical farming over the last like six years has seen that the technology cycle has changed very, very rapidly. Of course, the cost of supplemental lighting and artificial lighting has come down significantly, which has changed the economics for certain crops. Um, And that allows us to then look at different spaces within Singapore where we can actually unlock uh, the power of um, this technology. Now, we have, have, of course, uh, constraints in terms of the unit economics where we have a higher cost structure that we naturally have to uh, look at because you have to uh, the local the local farming sector is um, is also competing with the free market and food coming in so we have to be able to uh, we are actually at a point where uh, a lot of different technologies are uh, te- being tested in different forms to be able to see which are the more successful ones uh, for us i think um, the technology has been uh, quite uh, quite a ride i mean things have changed so rapidly it's of course uh, vertical farming is an expensive high capital intensive uh, industry. So it's not easy to be able to uh, get into unless you're heavily funded. And uh, what happens is that there's, of course, uh, a need to be able to uh, then run smaller pilot projects. And maybe the economics in these pilot projects will not have enough incentive to be able to reduce the cost of production or the productivity may not be as high. So those are some of the challenges, but I'm strongly a believer of uh, the ecosystem approach that Singapore takes. Uh, in terms of uh, bringing together research, bringing, bringing together the government, bringing together, um, you know, cross, uh, you know, different expertises to be able to uh, innovate within this space. And that's going to significantly drive the cost down in the years to come. Thank you very much. It would be interesting to hear Anders Riemann's perspective on those costs uh, that is related to uh, vertical farming and how you're working with that uh, from your perspective. Yes, so we we are trying to optimize as many procedures as possible. So uh, we we do not do any unnecessary manual work. Uh, so traditional farmers on farmland have innovated for ten thousand years, and now their uh, uh, productivity level is very very high. So we we can't uh, be a um, supplement to this. Uh, uh, innovative uh, uh, farming if we are not uh, able to optimize our own production. So that would be one way to uh, get to a, a more 
uh, cost-effective uh, production, and and then uh, the uh, LED light will of course still be uh, developed. So uh, for the cost for photosynthesis will be better and better and better, and then. Um, uh, third, uh, not least, uh, we need uh, ourselves and also universities and uh, different companies to uh, breed plants. So the weed we see on the uh, fields today is not the same weed that uh, they, that was grown 10 years ago. It's a plant that has been bred, uh, so it will be optimized for the conditions in which it is uh, growing in. So. We need uh, different types of plants to be uh, bred so they can fit into uh, the climate and, and conditions of a vertical farm. Thank you very much. I think um, it would be interesting also to hear Dr. Ritubala's perspective on this topic as Anne also is mentioning about automation because that also demands that the employees do have new skills or at least that they are educated in a different way um, and able to also and also the interesting perspective on uh, new seeds that are adapted to vertical farming. How yeah. are you working with that from and how is that looking into the future if you take that from a research point of view? Yeah, so I mean the, the two points that you mentioned and I mean the other speakers mentioned as well. So that will be a, a we should have the correct, uh, you know, the skill set that our uh, workforce should be having, right? So that's what exactly, you know, like um, our role is as an IHL, an institution of higher learning. So we do take into consideration in terms of the learners needs as well as what are the industry demands. So rightly, as you put it, right, it is not the same skill set that is required. There's a lot of automation and a lot of integration of technologies that is required over here. So uh, at least a basic understanding uh, is needed by anybody who works on a farm to be able to work with them because uh, the technology is there and to be able to adopt it, you need to have an understanding on it. So that's what we have in mind and we have been uh, doing our programs, uh, outlining the structure of our programs is always done in consultation with the farmers, working very closely with the farms, the agencies, the consumers themselves as well, in terms of looking into the demands that are there I mean, at the point, the uh, Republic Polytechnic is one of the leading institutions in agri-tech. And uh, this is uh, when we started way in 2019 to have our diplomas rolled out, okay? And this is again, keeping in mind when the industry is ready. So everything needs to go hand in hand. So our first uh, uh, graduating cohort will be in October this year itself. And then at the same time, we see the need in terms of more in terms of uh, technology, as well as uh, deepening in the agribusiness side. So now we're rolling out another course, which is going to be focusing on technology as well as agribusiness. So this will be a specialist diploma. So as the needs and as the technologies advance, I guess the training has to go hand in hand. And uh, yes, the research is another aspect of this. So we are working very closely and uh, I'm really very proud to say that Republic Polytechnic works very closely with the industry partners. I mean, to the extent, yes, yesterday we were there on Ankesh's farm. <laughs> in the morning we were there with our team of researchers and looking into the demands and the, so it's always like develop a technology that can be adopted. Otherwise, you know, it just stays in the lab or it's just like, uh, it's like you're solving a million, uh, you know, you're spending million dollars to solve a two cent problem. So we don't want to be the ones doing something like that. Yeah. Thank you very much. So now we heard a little bit from all of you that all the positive aspects surround vertical farming, but there might also be some pitfalls um, or some challenges that we are seeing uh, and perhaps you already have experienced and that as you see in the future. And um, perhaps we can take the same round again. Uh, Rasmus, what is your perspective on that? Is it um, possible hey. to, to consumers to buy? Oddly, um, oddly, it's it's uh, it's actually well. I don't know if it's odd, but it's it's actually regulation, um, and and uh, it's even uh, in relation to some of uh, the ones we actually, uh, in many ways, re really like. So today, for instance, in Denmark and many other countries, it is so that organic has a spe special position uh, in the world, and we cannot call it organic because uh, we don't use soil. And that means that uh, in front of the consumer, when you're in the supermarket, you have to make a pretty quick choice and it's hard to 
read a long story. But if you have that organic brand, it's a good marketing tool. So it's really the marketing that is tricky here. Uh, then in, in some places like in Denmark, uh, this, the state has put down a, a requirement to uh, use, I think it's 90% organic in the public sector. Uh, so it's basically been monopolized for, for, for this type of existing farming. And again, I, I actually think organic is doing a lot of good things. We want many of the same things. There's many parallels. The issue here is that uh, the new uh, developments and new, um, new innovations cannot enter the market. Well, it has a much harder time. So you, you basically see reverse subsidies um, and, and, and that, is, uh, that is slowing down uh, innovation. And it's uh, it's limiting the climate impact we will have, uh, and it's directly against uh, the the interest of, of of society and the government. It's it's most certainly not intended, uh, but but that is actually one of the big challenges we're seeing in in this sector. It's also a big challenge in other sectors where climate technology comes in, such as energy and so on, where there's big in incentives and subsidies and programs in place for existing industry, for instance, for the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and here, I think somebody told me there's 185 different programs in support of ex existing agriculture in Denmark. Thank you. So the regulation is one of the key elements here uh, in order to overcome some of the challenges. But technology so, so maybe, I should, maybe I should just uh, say that there is a few countries that are, are moving ahead with this. Uh, some states in the US, uh, some places in the Middle East, and I think also in 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 Asia, but uh, but there's others here that would know that better. Perhaps uh, Ankesh has a good uh, perspective on that area. How does it look in your region? Yeah, look, I mean, I I completely understand where Rasmus is coming from. The uh, for 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 my uh, point of view, and I think uh, what I'm noticing is that the consumer perception about the food uh, over so many years. Uh, has been that it's treated as a commodity. And today when we are producing food in a higher cost environment, the last thing we want to do is be able to just service a small part of the uh, population, which is the part of the population that can afford uh, a higher cost uh, of production. So that is, I think, against the fundamental principles of what we're trying to do. So it's very important to be able to um, you know, bring that cost down uh, and that comes with scale but then associated with that is the risk of distribution because um, when we scale up, uh, let's say we let's say we scale up and we take a decision to you know increase our production by let's say five times. Now the challenge there is that if we are not able to effectively distribute that product, uh, then of course it becomes a very difficult uh, situation because these are perishable products. And I think the the biggest value addition of uh, technology like this is to produce perishable products because the perishable product the Asian perishable product supply chain is so complex and it changes hands so many times uh, that there's a huge amount of distribution and losses along the way. So uh, I think for me personally, like vertical farming is a very, very important solution for the perishable product, um, uh, primary production of perishable produce, especially in Singapore. Uh, but the challenge that I think a lot of the farms today are facing are uh, the consumer mindsets in terms of perception about uh, the vegetables being treated as a commodity. So I think decommoditizing this commodity is a very important part, which goes with consumer awareness and I think a little bit of sophistication and maturity. Thank you. And, and Anders, how are you working with the distribution? You are a large indoor farm. You have a large indoor farm and distributes a lot to different possible, uh, different customers. How are you overcoming those challenges? And, um, and how do you see the consumer mindset? Yeah, so uh, we, uh, our location is uh, uh, chosen out of a strategic perspective uh, for the distribution. Uh, so we are located right where uh, uh, most fruits and vegetables are distributed uh, to the Danish consumers. So we see two types of transportation. One is when you import and one is when you distribute. And um, and as a large-scale uh, centralized producer, we, we need the distribution network. So we will just adopt to the uh, current distribution network and, and distribute directly to uh, large supermarkets and, uh, and uh, other distributors. 
that would distribute to restaurants, hotels, and canteens. But uh, I want to add to uh, Rasmus's uh, uh, <coughs> uh, challenge about uh, the organic certificate that uh, it, it's 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 more uh, challenging than that, uh, especially in the Danish market, because most uh, funds for research are dedicated to uh, research done in uh, open land field. So um, th there's, it's very, very limited uh, the access uh, vertical farms uh, have in Denmark to, for uh, getting uh, grants for, for research. And, and in addition, we have to compete with uh, farmers who get uh, direct support from the EU to grow on um, uh, land that should have been forest if we didn't uh, produce food there. So we really, is specifically in Denmark uh, and in Europe, there's really a, uh, it's really a challenge to be a vertical farm because there's absolutely no support from the government in terms of either grants or other subsidies. Not that vertical farming should live of subsidies, but we have to compete on the same level and then uh, either get a volume subsidy or uh, stop giving subsidies to uh, traditional farmers. Thank you very much. So you have handled the distribution, but it also might be different in, uh, in Denmark and uh, Europe compared to Singapore and that you actually need to to transport it in a different uh, perspective and a different way, at least. Um, I think it's also interesting to hear a little bit about these uh, parts of the uh, funds and research from uh, Rachel Bala's perspective. Uh, how is that looking into the Singapore region? Um, is that something that is uh, possible for vertical farmers to get yeah. today? So, I mean, like, um... Uh, points that have been mentioned from the Denmark side is also, to some extent, yeah, they do apply in Singapore as well. And like what Anka is highlighted, there are certain things in terms of the regulations that the farmers will need to take care of and the consumer demand. You know, what says, are we, do we need to reach the masses or are we just uh, serving to some segment of the consumers? But in terms of research, we are looking into uh, helping the growers here in Singapore in terms of uh, working on the quality of the crops, you know, how can we differentiate our crops from the, uh, from the mass market or from those that are coming into Singapore. So that is where our research focuses are as well. And uh, this could include even, you know, in terms of selecting the right varieties to grow, to give it a head start. And at the same time, so that when the growers are, do, uh, you know, investing in terms of growing indoors, they also tend to have a produce that matches the kind of cost of production they have gone through, right? And uh, again, when we look at the consumers, I do see uh, interest in terms of the local price. So the government has been trying to promote the local produce or, you know, selecting your, what is produced locally. So we do have in Singapore, we're promoting a label over there that says uh, grown locally or SG local. And at the same time, there are also standards rolled out here to differentiate the crops in terms of the quality, as well as the sustainability, the cleanliness, which is also something that the consumer is looking for. So you, you want your crops to be safe in the first place, the food that you eat. And then uh, secondly, it is uh, in terms of the sustainability part, you know, what has gone into the crops in terms of the resources that we are having here. So for that, again, we have the standard, which is called as a clean and green standard, just recently rolled out with Singapore government. So again, this is, uh, we are also giving training in that area to educate the farmers, the consumers on the other side in terms of, you know, what are we talking about when we're saying grow locally? It's just not about, you know, just growing here. How are we becoming resilient in terms of food security by growing locally? So there's a lot of consumer education still needs to be done. But uh, I believe I can see uh, I can see the there's acceptance for our local food and the, what is being grown locally. And I believe that with research and the way we are going to do it and all the technologies moving forward, uh, the consumer will see the value as well in selecting the locally or you know grown through these vertical farms. Yeah. 
Um, what what do you think is the what would the future bring within sustainable farming and also vertical farming? Will it be possible to grow more uh, different kind of crops, um, etc., within vertical farms? Um, any challenges here, or is it possible to extend it even more? Well, if you're asking me, uh, okay, I, I do get this question very often in terms mm -hmm. of what can we grow in a vertical farm. So for the question, what we can grow, actually we can grow everything because given you have the control on your temperatures, you have a control on the nutrition, you have a control on the light, the amount of light in the plant is, practically you have everything. And now it, it, given the technologies, you know, you even have remote control of your farms and everything. So in a way, it does sound like uh, we have a solution to all the problems. But then uh, these solutions really come with a cost. And um, when I say cost, it is uh, both literal, literally a cost as well as a figurative cost, you know, in terms, because I think uh, previously was mentioned during the discussion here as well. Um, in an intensive farming or vertical farming, as we call it, is resource exhaustive, right? So it, it is very important. We have to know this. So what we could do in order to increase this or the extent or make it more a success is tapping on what vertical farming can do. You know, for example, it promises you a, a produce that is consistent throughout the year. You can grow the same crop with the same quality throughout the year. So we should focus on the strengths of it. It gives us the zero miles. So we should focus on a crop that really the zero miles or really make a difference. So by focusing on the strengths of this vertical farming, I believe we can definitely, you know, uh, have make it more successful. And uh, even like, you know, when we talk about it, we, you don't need to really have uh, the pesticide sprayed on it and all. So over there again, it becomes like, what kind of seeds are you using to grow? You know, I, I have seen farmers going in and buying varieties which are pest resistant. Or, or drought resistant. And you don't need those kind of varieties in your indoor farm, right? The challenges in an indoor farm are very different. So being able to tap on or a little more on the plant science, which is actually the center of the farming, right? <laughs> so sometimes I feel there's too much focus on the technology and we're forgetting the center. Not because I'm a plant scientist myself, <laughs> but more because after all, we're doing everything for the plant, right? So trying to uh, fit the plant to the technology, I always say, try the technologies to fit to the plant, you know? So those are things that we need to work on as well. Yeah. Sorry, Christine, you're muted. Oh. So I would like to ask you, Anas Riemann, about this, about the plants, because in the, the Scandinavian region, we do talk about um, the Nordic cuisine a lot and that we are growing, uh, growing very close to where we are um, having the restaurants and that we also have the specific taste of the uh, vegetables and also the, the, yeah, the different um, ingredients. But um, is it possible to to change the taste uh, any possible way uh, and or how can you manage that in vertical farms? Yeah, so uh, before we start a new variety in our uh, uh, scale production, then we uh, would uh, prepare a growth formula or growth recipe for that particular uh, crop. And uh, that will dictate the uh, uh, fertilizer solution, uh, temperature, uh, light intensity, and light spectrum, and CO2 level in the air, and the oxygen level in the uh, water. And uh, when uh, preparing this growth recipe, we discover uh, how the taste and the form of the plant would change every time we change some of the plant's parameter. So, we, we strive to make the, uh, to, to make the taste as uh, the consumer prefers it. So when our research team uh, does these uh, experiments and every once in a while they will come up with or, or present us with uh, five different uh, tastes of uh, the same plant which have, have had different uh, growth recipes and then we'll choose the taste which we 
uh, believe uh, would be most preferred by the consumer. Thank you very much. And then it's also possible to export the plants and adapt the taste, I guess. Yeah, except that uh, we don't want to export the plants. We, we want to build uh, vertical farms uh, uh, closer okay. to the consumer, so by the distribution centers, but yes. Yeah, thank you very much. So what is your perspective on that, Anke Shah, about the taste? Because, of course, you do have different taste preferences, and uh, that's also very much related to how consumers perceive the quality of the products. Um, how are you working with that area? Yeah, look, I think there's a lot of uh, interesting research to be done here. Um, there's, uh, I think that we're very, very early when it comes to uh, getting into the world of, you know, nutrition, genetic expression, the flowering time, the maturity time, secondary metabolites. There's so much to be done when it comes to that, uh, the sugar content, the vitamin C content, the ability to be able to control the light. Uh, the spectrum is actually uh, something very, very novel. It's still very early days. And that's when, you know, collaborations uh, with Republic Poly and there are many other institutes also working uh, in this front. Uh, that's when the academia can actually meet the commercial farm so that the commercial farm does not recreate the wheel. There are many different commercial units that are running and finally it has to be market driven. So if the market is looking for a specific variety, which is, let's say, of a certain size, easy to cut with a specific flavor, um, uh, then uh, the varietal selection, if it's done by the, academ by the academia, it's much easier for the commercial farms to then just focus on what they're good at, which is actually producing the plant. I think that level of specialization, once it comes in and it will get there, um, then that will certainly affect the entire uh, vertical farming sector in Singapore and probably uh, be a very good uh, a very good solution for what Singapore to be able to export these uh, ideas and um, uh, varieties to other countries. Thank you very much. I think we will move over to the Q&A here and see if there are any interesting questions we can talk about. And I can see that uh, John has asked the questions, what are the collaboration with the seed providers? Are there more desirable traits pre-selected for? Um, anyone who's, any of you who would like to answer that question or have a good answer? Uh, maybe I can take a quick stab at it. Uh, so the seed varieties today, the big seed companies uh, have been, you know, they spend eight to nine to 10 years developing varieties for outdoor use, for, you know, biotic stresses, abiotic stresses, and millions of dollars goes into these varietal developments before it finally reaches the market, we, even if it's for greenhouse use. Uh, today, what's happening is because the industry is so new, yes, the big seed companies are taking notice. Uh, but uh, it takes time for the final variety to be selected and maybe the market and vertical farming is not big enough uh, for them to be actually developing the critical mass of seed needed to, uh, to make a business out of it. So what's happening is that there are small startups now looking at uh, specific uh, crops. Of course, the uh, leafy greens are the low hanging fruit because I think across the vertical farming sector, across the countries, uh, leafy greens is the first crop of choice simply because the entire portion of the plant can be uh, can be consumed. There are very little, uh, you know, waste in terms of the non-edible portion. So, but very rapidly, I'm seeing that, uh, you know, as an owner of a seed company myself, I'm very interested to see what, how genetics can play a part uh, in reducing the maturity and making it more suitable in terms of um, productivity for the final uh, cost of production to come down. Thank you very much. Um, do we have a more perspective on that question? No, and you are more than welcome to ask more questions in the Q&A chat. Um, I can add a little bit there, Kristen. I, yeah. I really think that we have to, we have to kind of like uh, pull ourselves out of thinking agriculture here. And I think that Ankesh is really smart because he went into seed development that's going to be huge in vertical farming. And, and we, we need to have control over the technology. That's, that's, the, that's part of the winning formula. Uh, that's, that's where the real, the real game is going to play out here in, in, as, as, we, as we mature in this industry. So think about vertical farming much more as, as the computer industry. Like back in the early zeros in the 90s, uh, and, and also later on, but when, when we still were developing the hardware platform, 
that you would see a new uh, RAM circuit coming out, a new CPU, a new hard disk, and then the next generation would come and you would have this upward spiral of a number of different new innovations coming in. Some of it will live shorter, some of it longer, but you had this building on top of each other's sh shoulders and it went super, super fast. We'll see the same kind of development here, but much faster. And it's already going extremely fast. You're also seeing you, this, this that we're getting at critical mass means that for instance, a very important thing is the light because it's like almost half the cost, right? Um, we're seeing that now there's a critical mass so that the big LED producers are starting to have horticultural uh, LED lines. And, and literally they're just taking what they have and adapting it a bit. They just didn't do it before because there was not enough of the market there. And, and I think we will see some of the same here. And since we can harvest like 16, 17 times a year, we can also develop 16, 17 times faster and test things actually more than that. So when it takes eight to 10 years to develop for outdoor field, this will be 16 to 17 times faster just by that, but much, much faster because we have a controlled environment. So comparing to what la happened last year, we don't have to take into all these factors of having a lab without a roof. We have one where it's exactly the same as last time. So this is this is going, this is extremely exponential. And, and I think we will be, I mean, people will get really, really surprised what's going to happen here. And I believe that, that we will see basically all, I mean, most of the crops we, we eat uh, go indoor. It will take a few years, but it's totally right. The first ones and where we should start is the, is the uh, things that go off fast and, and, uh, and things where we can eat the entire plant fast. Thank you very much. Um, what's actually been talked about from all of your perspective and been mentioned here is also about the funding that uh, you need a little bit more support in order to escalate uh, the volumes and uh, in terms of more related to regular farmers uh, or at least uh, that the government is looking into this technology from another perspective or a new way of doing it. Um, how do you see, um, what, what is, should an investor think of here? Uh, what is of interest? Why should they in, uh, invest in vertical farming? If you make a short pitch, we have three minutes left. So if all of you make a short pitch of that. You can take the word, Rasmus, you're on. Okay. Actually, I don't think that, that we should have support. We should just not have the opposite. That was also what Anas was saying. So, so uh, just a level playing field. And, and then uh, both, first and foremost, in, uh, uh, financially. And, and then the other one is, is uh, I would like to see it's also that we really um, count in our CO2 footprint. So, so let's calculate that in and get a CO2 tax. Thank you. Then, then we are very competitive, uh, but we are also competitive without it. Uh, and and uh, I mean, as I used to be a partner in a venture fund, I've been a couple of different venture funds, done a number of uh, startups uh, before this. And, and, um, and, and this is a damn good business. Thank you very much. And as what is your perspective? Uh, so uh, adding to uh, Rasmus's uh, uh, statement about uh, support, uh, we, we, it would be, a, uh, and CO2 uh, emission, it would be a good idea to, to transform the organic certificate into a uh, sustainable certificate that could be graded in different ways. And then uh, uh, the environmental impact could be uh, easier to compare to, uh, for instance, the organic uh, production out on fields. And for investors, uh, this is an industry that are growing uh, uh, exponentially. And um, right now we are not handling the CO2 emission. We are still uh, growing by three parts per million every year. So the extreme weather phenomena will come at a more frequent rate. And uh, we uh, can't be uh, certain that uh, in the year 2050, uh, we had, had secured the, the food supply and uh, vertical farming is uh, part of securing that uh, food supply uh, when it's further developed and, and can also uh, be profitable uh, producing some of the more solid uh, vegetables. So uh, for all of our uh, uh, 
security for, for also having uh, food uh, in 30 years from now. Uh, it's a, a very uh, uh, Secu it's a very good thing to uh, to start developing the technology uh, already. So let's not forget why the uh, subsidies for farmers were invented in Europe, and that was uh, to make sure that uh, Europe's own population could be fed, and also to secure that uh, if a new world war would start or anything else, uh, the uh, or any other catastrophe, then uh, there would be food for, for the population. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, the time is running up. I would love to hear Ankesh and Ritu's perspective on this as well. But uh, the time is up at 11, and um, I think it's an interesting topic to continue discussing. Um, but thank you all of you for participating today in the webinar. I hope that all of you that have joined it uh, found it inspiring and interesting to hear both the Danish and Singaporean perspective on this. And uh, I know that it's possible to look uh, into the recorded version of this webinar a bit later. Um, so I give the word over to Jody. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christine, for moderating today's panel discussion. And on behalf of SG Innovate, I'd also like to thank all of our panelists. I'd like to thank Ritu, Ankesh, Rasmus, and Enders for taking time from the schedule to join us for today's panel discussion. And it was really interesting to find out more about um, innovative vertical farming methods and to also it is also heartening to see the progress that both Singapore and Denmark are making in creating more sustainable agricultural practices um, to maximize food productivity. I also like to give special mention to Ambassador Sandra Yandi for sharing her welcome remarks alongside Dr. Lim Jui, as well as our close friends at the Royal Danish Embassy um, in Singapore for making this event possible. For our attendees, thank you so much for tuning in. And while we were not able to answer all of your questions due to time constraint, um, I hope that you still managed to enjoy the very insightful discussion that we had today. And as Christine mentioned earlier, you can catch um, a recording of our webinar on our YouTube channel over the next few days. And please also keep a lookout for our post-event EDM that will be sent to your inbox. So with, um, lastly, I would like to... I'd like to thank everyone for your time today and we do hope to see you at future events at SG Innovate and please have a great evening or morning or afternoon from wherever you're tuning from. Thank you so much. Goodbye.